All right, now we're going to talk about general relativity. Uh, I like this little cartoon by XKCD. Problems that get harder uh, when you bring in general relativity, which is a huge pile, and then things that get easier, uh, nothing. Obviously, general relativity makes things harder. Uh, remember in special relativity, that was all about when you have an inertial reference frame, which means a non-accelerating frame. And we dealt with it pretty deeply because I think we, we had the right math skills for it. However, for general relativity, the math gets insane. One of the hardest classes I ever took was actually general relativity. That's because the whole form of math becomes even more complicated. Things work with what are called tensors. Uh, and the equations themselves uh, do some pretty crazy stuff. But what it really means um, is that we're going to see that uh, space and mass... Um, they're all related to each other. So mass will sort of bend space time or the other way around as well. And we're going to see that um, this thing right here we call the equivalence principle is going to be important here. So here's the good news, by the way. I got ahead of myself. The good news is we don't have to go into all the crazy math because it's way beyond what we need for high school. You can look it up. It's absolutely possible. It's just it gets a bit heavy. And so it's not really needed for IB physics. So what we do is we just deal with the results of general relativity. And what general relativity is, this is for any reference frame. It can be accelerating. That's the difference. Keep in mind, it didn't take Einstein very long at all to uh, come up with, um, well, not come up with, but to, to develop this theory of special relativity. But it took him years to do general relativity. So just keep that in mind. What took Einstein years, uh, it's probably pretty deep stuff. That, and it is. But I love this equivalence principle here. What it says is that you can't distinguish between an accelerated frame of reference and a frame in a uniform gravitational field. So, so what does that mean? That means that if you're sitting inside a rocket, for example, so we're going to have an accelerated frame of reference. Let's just say you're sitting, here we go, here's you, inside a rocket. Maybe it's a girl. Uh, oh, God, I tried to draw eyes. I don't know what happened. She's got like a visor and I don't know what happened to her eyes. Oh, well. Uh, so she's sitting in a rocket here. And the rocket's accelerating, let's just say, at, oh, I don't know, 9.81 meters per second squared, for example. If she's accelerating at 9.81 meters per second squared, she, if, and let's assume that she doesn't have any windows at all, so she can't see outside, everything will seem just fine to her. If she's accelerating at 9.81, she can throw a ball up in the air, and the ball will go exactly the same thing, right? It'll go sort of a ball will go straight up and come back down. All the math you could do, it'll seem just like if you were on Earth in a gravitational field where you have g equals 9.81 meters per second squared. That is the opposite squared. Yeah, there we go. So that would be the same exact thing as her standing on Earth. I gotta draw the visor again, I guess, right, to do it. But basically, her, you know, drawing the same thing here. So she wouldn't be able to notice any difference. Which is kind of cool, which is, it kind of means you can make artificial gravity. Have you ever seen movies, for example, where, you know, if you're accelerating enough, you could really be fine. You could walk around your ship just fine. Um, what they've done, and they've got designs for spaceships, whereas a spaceship travels this way, you imagine you had a big ring, and that ring rotates at such a speed that you're feeling a, a force of 9.81. Sorry, not a force, I guess an acceleration but uh, that would be caused by a centripetal force. So you could figure out how fast would you have to rotate this thing in order for you to have 9.81 meters per second squared. If you ever saw the movie, um, uh, oh, what was it called? Oh, The Martian, that's it. Oof, I was thinking like Mars, uh, no, The Martian. That was a couple years ago. But if you saw that movie and the spaceship, they had a spaceship that actually did that. So that's the idea. You can sort of simulate gravity in a sense by doing that. As long as you accelerate at 9.81, it's just like if you're on Earth, so everybody's happy. That's the equivalence principle. That's the first interesting thing. I like this run EMC instead of DMC, well squared, of course. So we have that gravity or mass affects space time. This gets really, really deep, so I'm going to do a very superficial version because that's all we need. But really, the, the Einstein's really amazing equations, they show how this four dimensional construct of space time would be warped basically by mass. And vice versa, by the way, they, they interact with each other. It's not just one. Um, it's often drawn like this, like is uh, on this diagram right here. We see like they draw space time as in like just like one sort of sheet of like a, I don't know, like a blanket. And it's like then that that mass sort of dents it. It kind of does that. But keep in mind, it's hard. We can't draw in four dimensions. So this is just us estimating 
trying to get our puny brains to understand something. The mathematics seem to hold, they're really deep, but this is the way we try to interpret it. So we can say that mass, uh, you know, it has a gravitational field, or at least it certainly affects it, and that will distort or bend space-time. So imagine the sun, imagine it's like sort of denting it. Now what's really interesting is that uh, because of that bend, uh, you could see that light follows space-time lines. So that means that if space-time is not bent, neither will light, but if space bends, so will light. Light will bend with the space. So what's interesting then, you end up with this cool effect. Watch this, look. You have the actual position of a star. Imagine you have a real star that's right here in the distance. You have our own sun that's in front, and you have your Earth here. Well, the light from that star could actually go this way and actually sort of bend this way. We won't know that it bent, though. So us, when we look, we're going to see the light. It's going to perceive position of the star. See, we're going to perceive the position of the star over here when really it was over there. It's kind of cool, isn't it? Uh, so we have this thing called gravitational lensing because of it. By the way, I like this, this play on those Obey shirts. Uh, so Obey gravity is the la ha ha. So here we have this effect happening, but in 3D, it's not just the star right there. Imagine this whole thing is happening all the way sort of around in a circle. So what happens then is this is you maybe on Earth. This is some massive object, let's say like, I don't know, a galaxy, for example. And you have the... Uh, the position of the source. So the source is really here. You have some bright object, maybe another galaxy that's really far away. And the light from it goes straight, but then it bends because of space-time, it goes down. So that light sort of bends and reaches us. So we will see it appear like it looked over here, apparent position. But that'll happen down there, and it's actually symmetric. It rotates. So these are actually called Einstein rings and this is a real picture. This is really what we see. So this is a real picture. By the way, I've seen this in Photoshop where they put like they make it like a smile and they put eyes and they see uh, you know the universe has a sense of humor. That's crap. This is the real picture here. So an Einstein ring, what that really is, is this is the effect of gravitational lensing, but done in you know all the way around. So it's rotated all the way around. So can you see that here we have this diffuse object here. This is actually a galaxy. So those have a few billion stars in it. Actually hundreds of billions of stars, I should say. So lots of mass. And behind it, we probably have some sort of blue galaxy, probably really, really far away. Now we can't see it because that's close galaxies in the way. But what ends up happening is the light from the far galaxy comes around and reaches us. And it reaches us around like that. So that makes this weird circle or this Einstein ring. It turns out if you look carefully at that ring, uh, you can actually determine the mass of this stuff in the middle. You can actually determine that. You can figure that out, which is kind of cool. And in fact, this is how we have evidence for dark matter. You can essentially weigh a galaxy. Here's another picture. There's a galaxy cluster. There's a whole bunch that so doesn't make one nice thing. It makes a whole bunch of these weird rings. But can you see these little smears here, these little places where it's been lensed? So we have some object behind it that's actually having its light sort of come around and reach us. So our models, what we can do is we can look at the amount of light that's actually in this galaxy. We can estimate the mass of the galaxy based on what is emitting light. We can do that. So there we can sort of estimate, okay, it must have a mass of this many kilograms. What's cool is these Einstein rings, they can tell us the actual mass in actual kilograms. And here's the problem, big surprise, the actual mass that is there is way more than what we actually see. So we can say, aha, there's even more mass than we're seeing. Maybe there's mass that's invisible. So remember before in other videos, we talked about that. If there's more attractive mass that's actually seen, uh, that's there, actually there than is seen, we can infer the existence of dark matter. So it's actually another form of evidence of dark matter is gravitational lensing. That allows us to sort of weigh a galaxy. We can put the galaxy on a scale in a sense by looking at this, which is kind of amazing. Even better than that, time moves slower. Uh, well, I should say sl slower relative to, so we should define it a little bit better. The closer you are to a massive body, the slower your time will seem to pass compared to someone farther away. This is true. So what this means is that if you're close to a big, like a gravitational object, some sort of close thing, if you're standing over here compared to if you're like way over here, for example, time for you in your clock right here will tick differently than time for someone over there. Crazy. 
And that's why I put this one again. Uh, this is a picture from the movie Interstellar. This is Matthew McConaughey. And he's like, that's what I love about relativity, man. Y'all get older and I stay the same age. It's a play on uh, a line that he actually said in a different movie. It's a bit meta. Uh, that movie was called Dazed and Confused. So maybe you've seen it. Anywho, it turns out that time is different depending on how close you are to a gravitational object. So this is what we need to worry about here. In the next video, I'm going to show you more detail to hopefully just like blow your mind. Kind of, what? So we'll put some math to it.